I'm wonder to be honest, I'm wondering. Should I get your bike in case it fades? Did you have your phone in your pocket? Yeah. In your pocket? Right? Yeah. Another action. <clears throat> Welcome to Television Centre Wood Lane. My name is Esme and I will be your guide around this working building. But action. Welcome to Television Centre Wood Lane, the world's first multi-studio complex. My name is Esme and I will be your guide. And action. Welcome to Oh fuck no. Welcome, welcome to television. No, you have to do that again, you need to pause, otherwise you can't edit welcome. it. I need a script, I'm finding it really difficult. Hello, but and action. Welcome! Television Centre Wood Lane, the world's first multi-studio complex. My name is Esme and I will be your guide. Journey around right, this stop. working Cut. building. I know. And action. Welcome to Television Centre Wood Lane. My name is Esme and I will be your guide on this magical journey around the world's <laughs> first nice multi-studio complex. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Bye. Bye. <laughs> and action. Well, here we are at the BBC News Centre, the largest news gathering broadcaster in the world. What you can see through here is 62... Okay, I want you to stop just to say... and action. Well, here we are at the BBC the largest news gathering broadcaster in the world. Action. Behind me is 62 million pounds worth of news centre. If you had looked through this window, May 1998, all you would have seen would be carpeted floors and painted walls. By November of the same year, it was home to over 650 workstations and over 1,500 journalists. Yeah, yeah. And action. This area here is the heart of the news gathering organisation. It is here that the international and home news editors sit, collating information from across the globe from various press associations such as TASS and Reuters. The computer screens they're sitting in front of are called the Electronic, news the Electronic News Production Systems and they contain text... Okay, cut. And action. This area here is at the heart of the news gathering organisation. It is here that the international and home news editors sit, collating information from across the globe from various press associations such as TASS and Reuters. The computer screens that they're looking at are called the Electronic News Production Systems and they contain text, 
visual images, some digital material as well, and eventually they will be able to edit on this particular piece of equipment. Behind them, on the screens, they're keeping an eye on the competition, such as Sky, CNN. But we are the largest news gathering broadcaster in the world. Significantly, CNN is only two thirds our size. The clocks, um, they show the times from across the globe, from London, Jerusalem, Moscow, New Delhi and Hong Kong. So when we're phoning up our correspondents, we're not waking them up in the middle of the night. This balcony, you can see up here, may be familiar and you'd be right. You may, oh, this balcony, do you want me to carry on? Or? Yeah, okay. let's turn action. Action. You might recognise the balcony behind me, and you'd be right. It is the backdrop for the 1, 6 and 9 o'clock news. However, Got Bad News, Hugh Edwards doesn't sit here, but he sits in a studio with a screen behind him, and this image of the balcony is computer-generated onto this, onto this screen. The camera that records this live footage is actually just over there, so it is all live footage. However, you will notice that the balcony behind me is just a quarter of a semicircle. And if you watch the news, at the end, it is a whole semicircle. What they do is they mirror the image to make it look twice as big as it really is. So you're learning all the little tricks today. Over here, this is where they... I think I should get up here. Should I or not? And action. You might recognise the balcony behind me and you'd be right. It's actually the backdrop for the 1, 6 and 9 o'clock news. However, I've got bad news. Hugh Edwards doesn't actually sit up here, but he sits in the studio with a screen behind him and this Im image is computer generated. Ah! Oh. In action. You might recognise this balcony behind me and you'd be right. It's the backdrop for the 1, 6 and 9 o'clock news. And I've got bad news. Hugh Edwards isn't sitting above us, but he's sitting in a studio with a screen behind him. And action. The balcony is actually recorded live from this camera up here. No, what the, I meant, the, stop, the, stop, stop. And action. Some of you, no, not some of you, you might. Okay, stop. Action. You might recognise this balcony behind me, and you'd be right. It's the backdrop for the 1, 6, and 9 o'clock news. However, Hugh Edwards doesn't sit here, but he sits in the studio with a screen behind him. And this image is computer generated behind him. And it's actually filmed in this camera just up there. However, if you look more carefully, the observant people amongst you. No, stop. I don't know where I'm going from. Where am I going from? Stop the top. Okay. Action. You might recognise this balcony behind me. And you'd be right, it's the backdrop of the news at 1, 6, and 9 o'clock news. However, Hugh Edwards. No, stop. So the news at. <laughs> and action. And action. You might recognise this balcony behind me, and you'd be right. It's the backdrop from the news at once. Action. You might recognise this balcony behind me, and you'd be right. It's the backdrop from the news at one, six, and nine o'clock. However, Hugh Edwards doesn't sit here, but he sits in the studio with a screen behind him, and this image of the balcony is computer generated onto this screen. It's actually filmed by this camera here, just behind me. And action. You will notice this balcony behind me is just a quarter of a semicircle. And on the back of the news at 169, you'll notice it's a whole semicircle. What they actually do is they mirror the image to make it look that's as big as it really is. So you're learning all the little tricks today.
And action. Said that. Action. The news centre is actually called a bi media centre. For the very first time in 60 years, radio and television news is coming from the same centre. What used to happen in the olden days is that radio news used to come from the broadcasting house and television news used to come from here. What we found was we were sending out two teams to cover one story. Now what happens when one team goes out and covers that same story? That package can be used in various lengths. For instance, the whole package is 20 minutes can be used in the news and The audio from that same report can be used for, say, Radio 5 Live. And then the extra down version of the same report can be used when you can use at 1, 6 or 9 o'clock. But also, as our celebrities, for instance, Moe Moolam in the olden days would have to make a full of house and house for you to be there for radio, then get in a taxi, and come across the whole of London, and then be interviewed here on the television. Now, he's out of the centre, and just come over here and be interviewed for radio and television. Of course, really, it should be called the Chinese Media Centre, which of course seems to be broadcast online as well. Over the week of Hunt's train crash, there were over 3 million hits to that one particular site. Looking over there. And action. And as you can see, coffee is a major feature amongst the broadcast journalists. In order to cope with all the stress, deadlines, lack of sleep, and general pressure. If you look through there, none of them are smiling. Now I can't sleep. Can't sleep. <laughs> that was good though. <laughs> Um, no, okay. And action. And as you can see, coffee is a major feature amongst the broadcast journalists in order to keep them away, help them to meet those busy deadlines, long hours, lack of sleep, and so on. Lots of crap, but you. And action. Thank you. 
used to come from here. What we found was we were sending out two teams to cover one story. Now what happens is we send out one team from this building and they go and create a package lasting approximately 20 minutes. This full report we use for News 24. The audio from the same report could be used, for instance, for Radio 5 Live or a smaller edited down version could be used for the News 1, 6 and 9 o'clock. We also save our celebrities a lot of time and energy. For instance, Peter Mandelson. Mandelson, excuse me. And action. No, 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 you have to stop. Oh, no. Action. Well, here we are at the new centre. It's called a Biomedia Centre because it houses the international at home radio and television news for the very first time in 60 years. What used to happen is that the radio news used to come from the broadcasting house and television news used to come from here at TBC. It still does, but the radio news comes from here as well. What used to happen in the old days is that one team, a radio team, would be sent out from broadcasting now. I've already said that, shit, so... And action. Cut. Action. Well, here we are at the new centre. The new centre is actually called the Bimedia Centre. This means it houses radio and television news for the very first time in 60 years. What used to happen is that radio news used to come to the broadcasting house and television news used to come from here. And action. Where are you? <laughs> well, here we are in the hub, or the concrete donut, as Terry Wogan once called it. You may recognise it. It is, if you like, the face of the BBC. Do you want me to Here we are in the hub or the concrete donut as Terry Wogan once called it. You might recognise it if that's the face. <laughs> well here we are in the hub or the concrete donut as Terry Wogan once called it. It is if you like the face of the BBC. Many famous programmes have used this area. For instance, Morecambe and Wise did a f funny dance along here. Roy Carson did a tap dance with a thousand children tapping away. It also appears frequently on Blue Peter and Live and Kicking. It's quite a funny story about the shape of um, Television Centre. Sh I'll show you the fountain. I, I love it. I've got to do this quietly because I'm crossing Well, here we are in the hub or the concrete donut. Well, here we are in the hub, or the concrete donut, as Terry Wogan once called it. Welcome and Wise did a funny, whoa, did a funny little dance around it. Do you want to see it? I want to. I love it. Well, here we are in the concrete donut, or the. Oh no, sorry. Well, here we are in the hub of the concrete donut, as Terry Wogan once called it. Morecambe and Wise did a funny little dance around here. Roy Castle appeared here with a thousand children's feet tapping away for record breakers. This area often appears on Blue Peter and also on Live and Kicking. And as you can see, it's a working fountain. Oh no, it isn't, and there's a very good reason for that. If you look up here, this area is all in a circle, rather like a Greek amphitheatre. So, uh, instead of the gentle trickle of water cascading from here, it sounded like the Niagara Falls, which is a bit of a shame because Graham Dorbar, the, um, or T.B. Huxley Jones even, the architect for this particular fountain, um, had wonderful sketches of all the BBC staff 
washing themselves in the fountain of a lunchtime after they'd been in the sweaty studio. This area below here, there are actually offices down here. But what used to happen in the olden days is that this would be the transmission area. For instance, there might be an orchestra in Studio 1 over here and a ballet in Studio 8 over here. And then what they would do is run the cables underground and they would meet in the middle. And this area here would be the transmission area. This is signified at the bottom of by two of the statues. There's a lady here um, holding a lyre representing sound and on the other side there's a lady holding a mask representing vision. And out at the top there, at the top of that 40 foot plinth, is Helios, the sun god, shining his rays of light across the world rather like the BBC. Foundation stone for Television Centre was actually placed in 1956 and Television Centre started broadcasting in 1960. The design of the building itself was, has an interesting story. Cut. That was crap, wasn't it? And action. The Foundation stone for Television Centre was placed in 1956 and Television Centre started broadcasting so four years later. Action. The Foundation stone started broadcasting in 1960, just four years later. As you can probably tell by the architecture that it was of 1950s, 60s design. Cut. Action. We're sitting here in the hub, which gives us an opportunity to look at the architecture. Built by a man by the name of Graham Dorbar. The foundation stone laid in 1956, completed and started broadcasting in 1960. It's quite a funny story connected about the, the design of the television centre. If you were to look at television centre from an aerial view and look down, you would see that it's in the shape of a question mark. And there's a very good reason for this. Graham Dorbar was sitting in a pub with an old envelope and drew a question mark on a piece of paper. How am I going to build the world's first multi-studio complex? How am I going to do it? We still have this old envelope to prove it. He looked back at this old envelope with this question mark a couple of jars later and thought, do you know what, that's not a bad design at all. And if you look, this area here is the hook of the question mark, Studio 1, around to Studio 8, and this area down here is the leg of the question mark. And the new reception, completed in 1998, is if you like the dot at the end of that question mark. Action. Welcome to the hub of the concrete donut, as Terry Wogan once called it. This area behind me is, if you like, the face of the BBC. Action. So up to the top of this 40... Do it again. Okay. 
action. So bursting out of the top of this 40 foot plinth behind me is Helios the Sun God shining his rays of light across the world rather like the BBC which rather neatly brings me along to the history of the BBC. What does the BBC stand for? The British Broadcasting Corporation. It used to be a company founded in 1922. Radio manufacturers came together because they wanted to sell more radio sets. But how were they going to do it? Between 1922 and 1924, um, radio broadcasting was actually banned completely. This is because the British government looked across the BBC to the um, to Do it the again. United States. Um, try Action. The BBC came together in 1922. Originally, it didn't stand for the British Broadcasting Corporation, but the British Broadcasting Company. Six radio manufacturers came together because they wanted to sell their radio sets. But how were they going to do it? They needed something to broadcast. This was slightly problematic because the British government had banned radio broadcasting. This is because they looked across to America and saw what was happening there, something called the American chaos. If you were sitting in a hotel room in New York uh, back in 1922, you wouldn't have been able to listen to one station because they all kept interrupting each other. And so the British government went to the other extreme and they banned broadcasting completely. It was actually an offence. But as I said, in 1922, BBC came together and formed the British Broadcasting Company. It became a corporation in 1926 when John Reith came along and took the BBC by storm. He was a Presbyterian man, a Scottish man, a moral man, a very forthright man, a force to be reckoned with, and he laid down the three pillars that we still try to adhere to today, which is to educate, to inform and to entertain. Another relevant person in the BBC's history is a chap by the name of John Logie Baird. He was a bit of a mad inventor to say the least, but a Action. And another very relevant person in the BBC's history is a chap by the name of John Logie Baird. Trained at Glasgow Technical College along with John Reith, however a totally different character altogether. Whereas Reith was a businessman, Baird was an inventor, and a bit of a mad inventor at that. He did things like take socks from the army, cover them in tarmac, and then try and sell them back to the army as waterproof socks. He was a sickly man, and his doctor in all, advised him in order to alleviate his depression to, um, to go to the West Indies. Um, uh, Is it what? Sorry. Action. Another very relevant person in the BBC's history is a chap by the name of John Logie Baird. Trained at Glasgow Technical College along with John Reith, but a totally different personality. Whereas Reith was a bit of a businessman, Baird was a bit of an inventor and a mad inventor to say the least. He did things like take socks from the army, cover them in tarmac and then try and sell them back to the army as waterproof socks. He was a sickly man and suffered from depression and his doctor advised him to go and take a holiday, have a rest, go to the West Indies. Whilst he was there, he noticed that there was lots of sugar cake and lots of fruit and he thought, yes, that's it, that is how I'm going to make my first million. So he made up lots and lots of jam. However, unfortunately, he forgot that these fruit all contained horrible little bugs and he had to chuck all of the jam away. It's quite a tragic story, really. His, um, his widow, who was left behind when he passed away, uh, was living in rented accommodation off a one hob stove which is very tragic when you think how many people today have television sets and what a kindly man he was. I spoke to one of his apprentices the other day who worked with him um, during the war um, on all his various exciting experiments and he'd do things like give um, young apprentices half a crown to go back into the room because the heat given off by television was so strong everybody kept um, kept passing out in the early days. Okay, cut. Of course Action. Of course, television really took off in 1953, the Queen's coronation. Around this time, there were 10 or 11 people around a television set. The, uh, the viewing figure, oh sorry, I did that big. And action. Of course, television didn't really take off until 1953, the Queen's coronation, where there were 10 or 11 people around. <laughs> Cut. And action. 
Of course, television didn't really take off until 1953 and the Queen's coronation where there were 10 or 11 people around a television set and there were approximately 18 million viewers. That's approximately how many people you get per episode of EastEnders these days.